Hello everyone, this is Bob Browner. Uh, this is uh, the curriculum recording for our uh, Maternal Child Health Initiative. It's put together by the folks below, and if you want to be part of the pro project and get your CME in Part 4 credit, you'll have to, if, and if you didn't make the meeting, you'll have to listen to this as an alternative. So this will review basically everything that's in the clinic presentations uh, for the curriculum. So why are we doing this? Uh, the why is the one of the most important things that I've found out over and over again. If people don't understand why they're doing a project, they just don't do as well, so you need to understand why. Uh, the biggest reason this is good for the health of our children in our community and their well-being determines the health of the next generation. It's the theme from the Healthy People 2020 goals. Uh, also, we do know that other uh, states, for example, that have taken on these organized initiatives have made a huge impact. So California, uh, the state actually took on an initiative when they saw their maternal, uh, maternal mortality rates raising uh, around the rest of the states, putting together an initiative, and their uh, maternal uh, mortality rates now are actually down to the rates that most of Europe has. So if you take an organized approach to something, it really does work. Uh, we have an example in our own community where we started working on breast and colon cancer screening in Lincoln in 2016. Uh, almost every clinic in town participated in this. Many of them uh, went on to join ACOs. And we have uh, data uh, going back uh, uh, to a couple of years ago at the end of the project. Not only do we have the highest colon cancer screening rate in the state, or we've been pulling ahead of our neighboring peers, I think it is partly due to this project. So I think we have some of our own evidence that we, when we as a community do this, it does work. So there are five reasons why you should do this. One, it's just put good place in care. Uh, second, it improves the health of your entire community if we do it all right as a group. Uh, third, you get style points if you're the best, and who doesn't like to have the best numbers in, in the city or the best ACO scores, for example. Uh, also, with the ACO contracts, you actually get paid better, so why not get paid for doing good work, too? And you get 30 hours of CME and a Part 4 credit if you do this, which uh, I think most people find valuable. Um, so uh, the well child checks and postpartum depression screening are going to be our areas of interest where we actually have discrete measurements. Uh, we are also going to try out prenatal care, although that's not required as optional, and we'll talk about why. So again, why are we doing this? Uh, well, one, uh, our state uh, data performance in these measures uh, is pretty crappy, actually. So overall, on uh, well child checks three to six years, Nebraska Medicaid patients are at the 33rd percentile nation nationwide. Uh, this comes right from our Nebraska Medicaid website. If you look at the three health plans, Nebraska Total Care, United Healthcare, and, and uh, WellCare, not, not only are they not meeting very good standards, they seem to be declining over time, which is bad. Uh, what really ir irks me is that the target is 52%, which is uh, essentially aiming to be a D student. I don't know why we're aiming to be a D student in Nebraska. Uh, we know nationally what the averages are. The average for Medicaid across the country isn't 52 percent, it's 63 percent. Why aren't we aver uh, opting for at least average? And if we care about our, our lower income people, why aren't we trying to get to 80 percent just like the commercial population? So uh, we as Nebraskans do a much better job with this. We can be A students and not aim for being D students like Nebraska Medicaid is telling us to do. So uh, also, of course, there's been a lot coming out. Most of you have been following literature on postpartum depression screening, know that there's multiple articles coming out from uh, the AAP and ACOG, all showing uh, the, the impact of maternal depression on everything from breastfeeding rates to uh, the social engagement of children. Uh, we are now seeing a transition to the term not postpartum, but perinatal depression, because we should probably even be screening before pregnancy, which some uh, obstetricians in our, clinic, our community are already doing. Uh, so peripartum depression screening guidelines are to do, from the AAP, are to do postpartum depression screening. And most people in the community are using the Edinburgh. The PHQ-9 is okay, although personally I prefer that we use the Edinburgh and modify it so that it's written uh, in, in Midwestern Standard English, not Scottish English. So we do have a, a slightly modified Edinburgh that most people are using. Um, to get your CME and your Part 4 credit, you need to do a couple things. One, each clinic that wants to participate has to designate a lead clinician who is responsible for completing the form and sending it to Mary Jo Gillespie. Her email is on the form and here, so you don't need to write it down. We'll send you the form. Individual clinicians that participate have to be part of the planning project, and at the end, they do have to log on and attest to receive credit. Timeline is this. Uh, initially, we were going to go for an April start, but because of everything going on with COVID, uh, that's sort of uh, thrown a wrench in everybody's works. We have modified the curriculum so you can start anywhere from April to June, do your mid course in either July or August, and then your final in October or November. Uh, so we'll see how as clinics get time. We've had a mad scramble due to COVID, uh, but some clinics are finding now that they've uh, gotten past the mad scramble, have enough cancel, uh, canceled wellness visits. They actually are discovering they may have some time. So if that's the case, you might want to start in April. Another clinic actually told me, you know, they're so sick of hearing coronavirus all the time, they'd actually like to focus on something else next week. So I have a meeting scheduled next week with one of the clinics that wants to do, ha, talk about something other than coronavirus for a while. So you can start anytime between April and June. Let us know and we'll modify the con the schedule for you. 
uh, basically you'll use this uh, spreadsheet which a lot of you have done before it's a fillable PDF form uh, we've taken out hard static timelines so you can pick your timeline based on doing it we need at least, at least two months between these so the first round will be when you start somewhere between April and June and that will determine the second and third rounds the three top percentages you need to set a goal for yourself the fourth is an option and you'll need an enumerated denominator at all three time periods and once you fill that out you'll complete the project the other needed thing is something called a workflow diagram. Uh, hopefully you've been actually doing things like this for your coronavirus planning. So this hopefully wouldn't be too new to you, but planning out who's going to do what as we change our workflows. Uh, we're doing massive changes already, so I guess why not one more? So uh, this is a curriculum, so you do have to go through the principles of quality improvement. Uh, for that, I use this quality improvement model. It's very similar to PDS cycle, or if you're a Six Sigma devotee, it's a DMAIC. They're all very similar, but I specifically like this one because it was created by a physician who talked about how he thought quality improvement made him a better doctor. So this is his model, and uh, I like it. Uh, I like it for a couple of reasons. It starts where we should start. We need to agree on the standard of care, and it's important that we agree, not somebody else. Uh, there's an article that came out a couple months ago in Health Affairs talking about clinician-directed performance being much better, and I completely agree with the, this Dr. Lara Gotin uh, that, sh that by us picking our measures, we'll do much better than if insurance company sticks us with it or the hospital tells us we have to. And that what they found is when they made this a clinician-led quality improvement, their numbers increased dramatically. Not only that, their profitability of their system got better too, surprisingly. Uh, and so I think it's important that we pick what is the right thing to do. And then we measure it and we define the standard of care. And so this was picked by doctors in our community. We said, we're, these are one we're gonna focus on. And we're gonna pick well child checks at zero to 15 months and three to six years, because we got the kids, get the, kid, get the kids in first and our rates of doing so are so poor. And then once they're there, we need to do the right things for them. And one of those right things we're gonna do is the postpartum depression screening. We'll do these optional measures. I'll talk about this at the end of the project, but we're gonna focus on these three as our measurables. Um, now there's a whole bunch of things that the AAP recommends that we do during an all well child check. We're not going to talk about standardizing those yet. All of you have your own preferences as using whether you want to use MCATs and ages and stages and a bunch of other acronyms. It, there's not, to me right now, uh, there's not a clear overwhelming one you have to use because the evidence for all of them is a little bit mixed right now. So really that's going to be up to your discretion which thing you want to do. But the one thing we do want to put into your well child checks for sure at this point is postpartum depression screening. So the postpartum depression screen, the recommendations out there uh, are, are multiple, but we're going to focus on making at least getting at least one screen done before the child turns two months of age. doesn't mean you can't do more, and I'd encourage you to do more. I think one of my favorite things is one of our OB clinics that's doing what you might call prepartum depression screening. They're using the 25 to 28 week check when the one hour GTT is done, because mom sometimes is sitting there waiting for an hour anyway to get her blood sugar drawn. Why not do the postpartum depression screening then? Uh, you may do it later on in pregnancy, and many of clinics are already doing this, but a minimum we want to see the minimum necessary is at least one postpartum depression screen uh, by two months of age will be our measure. Um, so the next thing, of course, you got to collect data and argue about the data. Uh, it will be wrong possibly the first time you connect it. So we learned this with our colorectal cancer screening project uh, that uh, people were getting numbers like this. Nobody is that bad, and I know they're not that bad. These are good doctors. I know they, their numbers weren't that bad. It was just their bad EHR report was wrong. It wasn't set up correctly. Uh, in this EHR, what happens, a physician hired his 15-year-old daughter to move all the stuff to the right place. Once they moved to the right place, they found out their baseline was actually pretty good. He then told this doctor uh, during the next measurement, who then hired his 15-year-old daughter who did that. They also had an additional problem in their EHR where it was a denominator problem where the, the EHR was counting patients multiple times that they'd seen three different physicians. They had to fix that too. Once they got clean data, then they actually got to figure out where they really were. Here is a clinic, though, that started with good data, has nice incremental improvement. That's what it looks like. But argue about the data first. Just get it out there. We know the data might be wrong, but it doesn't mean we can't fix it. So uh, if you want to build an organization that's going to work, you don't just throw out data and start ranking spanking. So don't treat this as a dysfunctional competition like some of us experienced in, in, in medical school or residency. We're doing this for the right thing. Make it a positive thing. Uh, next is you got to improve the data and make it better. To improve the data, you need to change some things in your clinics. And so uh, uh, some people say, why don't you just give me the magic workflow? Well, the reason I don't do is two reasons. Number one is I don't know what the magic workflow is for you because it varies from clinic to clinic. Second, the studies show that when you create your own workflow, it works better. So you know your staff better than any outsider like me knows. And you won't know what interventions your EHR, your clinic may or may not be capable of. There's a whole range of possibilities. And so it's up to you to figure out what those are and what the best is for your people and your, your intervention. So you may pick things like reminder systems, you may develop recall lists, you may retrain some MAs, LPNs, RNs to do some things so you don't have to, change your rooming processes, that is all up to you and that's the point of this is creating your plan. Then you'll put your plan together using your, the people you pick and the interventions you pick to come out with a plan. 
Uh, this is an actual plan from one of our colon cancer screening projects. Loken Pritchard from Hastings deserves the credit for this. He came up with this nice, elegant uh, way to put it all together, and it's nice because it's reproducible. You don't have to necessarily come up with a, as detailed and organized a plan as Logan. Uh, even something as uh, basic as sticky notes on a whiteboard will work for a workflow for a gram, although I encourage you to make it something reproducible so you can print it out. A common source of bad quality is that uh, people don't know what the plan is, and we may think everybody knows, but they don't. And if you can hand it out and say, here is the plan, this is what tends to lead to good quality. Uh, the other thing is, of course, you have to provide actual data to people. So one thing is running reports out of your IHR, what we might call a gaps in care, who didn't get what they were supposed to get. And so whatever measure it is, these are the people who didn't get screened, these are the people who didn't get their well child check. Why didn't they get it? Who can intervene to make a decision? Is it a reminder from the care coordinator, the front desk? We'd have to alert some reminders to make sure we get these things done. That's the actionable data is to take that report and find out who didn't get what needed done and why didn't they get it done and why, what can we do to make it better. Uh, and do this as a positive thing. Don't use a rank and spank. A lot of uh, times clinics have goofy competitions even. Uh, there were people for the colon cancer pro project who were giving people the magic poop emoji and things like that. Make it fun. Uh, another thing is good discussion amongst your clinic. This is from one of the uh, on one of my past uh, efforts. Uh, I presented this, and I usually start de-identified because not everybody's ready to show things right off the bat, and you probably should, don't want to do this right away first either. What was really cool about this presentation is this doctor actually outed himself. He said, "Oh, that's me, and here's why." And it turned out that the reason his numbers were bad wasn't because he was a bad doctor. Of course, there was a bunch of things that had happened. One, he had a change in a nursing staff; they weren't educated in the right place to put the screening results. Uh, they had been a little overwhelmed the last few months. So that led to a really good discussion, and once that clinic figured out all the all the workflow problems their clinic, they rapidly became one of the best clinics in the ACO. Interestingly, these people work in the same pod, so it was a workflow in that pod that wasn't present in the other pod. And so having that consistency across the clinic, what you'll find in clinics that get really good is everybody sort of comes up to the same performance, sometimes because the nurses take care of it for you, not because the doctors do it. Uh, lastly, of course, uh, you want to improve outcomes and show that you've, you've made a difference. Um, one of my favorite uh, summary projects was from Dr. April Brinkhoff at Fallbrook. Uh, they used that positive approach, and here they, she sent me a picture where essentially it was their whole project in a year. They had their 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 beginning, uh, their final, the workflows they put together. They circled who was doing best, made some changes, so the progress going up from 62 to 68. This was the right way to do it. And here in just one project, this is what a successful project at the end of the year might look like. So at the end, you'll finish this out. You'll have our first, second, and third rounds completed, a workflow diagram. Turn that all in, and then you'll have to do your attestation at the end. Uh, the last thing is first trimester access to prenatal care. So we do want to make a difference here. We do not have a discrete measurement we're, we're going to mandate for everybody, but we want you to try to try to create your own measures for this, and then on year two, we may, may add, incorporate it into the second year of the project. So why do you want to do this? Again, just like we said before, the health of our community is based on the future of our children. Uh, so trends in pregnancy related to our mortality are horrible uh, in the United States. We want to fix this for Lincoln and for Nebraska. Uh, the, the disparities are also horrible. So you see big differences based on income and ethnicity. We want to make these all better. And again, California had an organized project and they approached and they fixed it. We can do this too. So we would like to do this. And of course, one reason California, I think, is doing better is they have one of the best uh, percentages for early access to prenatal care. We're kind of middle in the road. We're not D students, but we're also not A students. So let's get us to become an A student. Um, we do have a way to track this on a, on a regular basis. Unfortunately, the community's tracking measure that's coming out of vital records is messed up. Uh, what you'll see here is depending on how they measure it, uh, it, could, it could be either 90% uh, of women getting in for prenatal care first trimester or it could be 75%. And the reason is they're trying to extrapolate from some missing data. I think the missing data ha may have happened during a transition at St. Elizabeth's here and then another transition here with Brian Health when they installed Epic. So I think we're working with bad data, but that doesn't mean we can't clean it up and make it better. Uh, we do know the types, the characteristics of women who don't get in to get prenatal care at, on a timely basis. That's p women who are young from different ethnic, from uh, minority uh, ethnicities, uh, women who have multiple pregnancies, lower education, and the women, women who have no health care coverage. However, this is a very fixable thing because Nebraska is a presumptive eligibility state. So if we educated our population and found out who is not coming in and why, we could fix this with a public education campaign, for example. Um, the other thing is that we can preempt this ourselves by doing pre-pregnancy counseling when women come in for wellness visits. Uh, and so one possible measure would be the percentage of women initiating prenatal care in the first trimester, but how we would measure it in our clinics, because we have to wait for them to come to them for prenatal care, is that during pre-pregnancy counseling, we'll ask them about it. 
ACOG recommends that you should ask all women during a wellness exam of childbearing age, would you like to become pregnant the next year? Uh, my wife Lisa does a lot of women's health and she actually phrases it sort of inversely. She'll say, are you trying not to get pregnant? Because if you're not trying not to, you essentially are trying to get pregnant. So uh, either way works, but you should ask women and, if, and, and make sure you educate them. So you may also want to talk about some social determinants things like do you have difficulty mating ends meet at the end of the month. This is one question that has been shown to be very sensitive for women who have other social issues that may be part of their problem. Uh, we have another draft form that we like that we'll give you too if you're interested in doing a little more on that. Uh, so pre-pregnancy counseling recommended. We should talk about diet medications, optimize any chronic diseases, screen for STDs, talk about alcohol, smoking, things like that. Uh, we are what's called a presumptive eligibility state. We've actually done some focus groups here in Lincoln and found out that a lot of women have no idea what presumptive eligibility is. So maybe one of the things we need to do is educate women. Uh, we've been talking about working with a lot of the folks in our community about how we might get that message out to everybody. Um, safety net clinics, we could even put a nice informational brochure up in the, in the pharmacy next to the pregnancy test saying, hey, if you be pregnant, you are eligible for Medicaid. We will help you. Please call this number. So we're working with the ethnic community centers on potentially providing that to our community and doing an educational thing to make this better. But we need you to help us figure out who's not coming in and why and what can we do about it. We really want your ideas on this. So again, our end goal is to make our community the healthiest community to raise a child because their well-being determines the health of our next generation. Uh, we also want to thank uh, funding for this uh, curriculum. It's been certified now. And so the CME in Part 4 credit is because of the funding we've received from the Help Me Grow Lincoln Lancaster County folks. So thank them uh, for providing the funding for this project because I think this has a lot of potential to make our community a healthier community. So if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, my email is below, browner at healthylincoln.org. Thanks.